Our next presenter is Dr. Robert Colbert. He graduated in 2008 with a BA in Contemplative Psychology and in 2012 with an MA in Transpersonal Counseling. <laughs> he is here today to share how contemplative education has shaped his quest for lasting social change. His talk is called The Inner Journey of Social Change. Welcome, Robert. Hello. Um, thank you all for coming out today. This is really exciting. Last time I was up here speaking was in 2012 when I addressed graduates from the Transpersonal Counseling Program. So I'm, I'm back now, six years later, as the newly minted doctor, Rob Colbert. Uh, thank you. And I'm here to share with you how contemplative practices have not only shaped um, who I am in the world, but also my academic pursuits and how I organize socially as a social activist in my community. My experience with contemplative practices began just shortly before I started at Naropa. It was actually the faculty student mixer when I came to the realization that I was pronouncing contemplative psychology wrong. <laughs> in the conversation, the woman was very nice, and she shared with me that the emphasis is on temple, contemplative, meaning with temple. And specifically, the contemplative practices help us learn a sense of sacred temple. What this has me meant to me is the idea of slowing the process down of taking my seat and noticing what I invite in and what I send out from this sacred temple. Contemplative practices slow this process down of taking our seat, and they give us the opportunity to gather a lot of insight. For instance, when I first started meditating, uh, what might happen is I would sit down and maybe what would come in was some critical self-thought and what I would send out was more critical self-thought, right? It was ridiculous. I would sit there and for 20 minutes I would beat myself up with critical self-talk for not meditating right, all while sitting on a cushion and meditating, right? So how, however, through the practice of building some skills, I, I discovered a sense of choice that I might notice my own critical self-talk coming in but instead of grasping onto it and holding onto it, uh, noticing this sense of choice, I would instead send out radical self-compassion. So this became a way for me to transform my day-to-day -day just simply by noticing what I invite in and what I send out. Contemplative practices became for me a way of finding right relationship with myself, a way of discovering what it is to sit there and just be. While I was working with these learning these lessons of sacred temple, I had a lot uh, in my life that was ripe with the opportunity to learn more and relate it to other experiences. It was around this same time that I watched for several years as my younger sister was diagnosed and medicated by doctors. Now, we all know that they're just practicing medicine, but the process of trial and error, watching them go through with these medications, was kind of devastating to watch. I watched for several years as she would go on a medication, she would experience some severe side effects, suicidal thoughts, and then would st spontaneously stop taking the medication. And because of this, she would experience crisis and even risk severe medical incidents. In retrospect, my sister was probably suffering issues of unaddressed trauma. However, fresh out of high school, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And, yes, for several years, just going on and off medications. In my meditations, what I observed was this coming in of contempt and distrust for psychopharmaceuticals. And what that led to often was uh, the sense of distrust and contempt being sent out and wanting to fight and tear down the whole thing. This was also transformed through contemplative practices. And what I noticed was actually making a commitment to learn alternatives to psychopharmaceuticals and to help others learn this sense of sacred temple. In continuing my pursuit with right relationship, I believe that this path could be of benefit to others. And I made the decision to continue contemplative education and do the Master of Arts in Transpersonal Counseling Psychology. I once heard the experience of going through Naropa's graduate programs 
as if, best described as if going to school to be a surgeon, but using your own arm to learn how to operate. <laughs> so I felt this in very real ways, right? Dissecting my own human experience to discover this sense of sacred temple. Allowing that to inform my practice as a steward for others to help learn this sense of sacred temple simply by being in right relationship with them. What I found through contemplative practices is that looking to find our center, just as we are, we become rooted in thousands of years of human history. So whether the contemplative practice is Buddhism or contemplative Christianity or Judaism, whether it's martial arts like Tai Chi or Aikido or expressive arts like calligraphy or painting, we are learning to take our seat centered in this sense of sacred temple at the table of thousands of years of human history. What I get is this image of Naropa as a game of musical chairs, right? The music plays, we all dance around, and when the music stops, we all take a seat, only to find that there's enough chairs for everybody. <laughs> so we sit, we share, we celebrate, the music starts, we get up again and we dance around, the music stops and we all practice taking our seat again and again and again. So in practicing this art of authentically taking my seat over and over again, uh, I found a renewed excitement for psychedelics. I specifically as alternatives to some of the traditional treatments. Having experimented them with them when I was younger, I could speak to my own sense of transformation, but I could also speak to the sense that I never had the urge to overdo it with these, at least not the same way that I might overdo it with alcohol. So also during my time in graduate school, there was a, resurg a resurgence of uh, research and literature coming out on the use of these medicines. Uh, like MDMA or psilocybin to treat everything from addiction to obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, treatment resistant post traumatic stress, and even help adults with autism cope with social anxiety. Faced with these contradictions witnessed from the psychopharmaceutical industries um, and this long history of advocacy for psychedelics, a group of friends and I felt it was important enough that we started the Naropa Alliance for Psychedelic Studies. <laughs> The mission of NABS is to form an alliance representing the rich traditions and disciplines of Naropa University, aiming to educate the community and inspire dialogue about the historical and current convergence of psychedelics with psychology, spirituality, and science. So in noticing that what medical doctors had was these drugs and they were just experimenting with them to see what behavioral changes might take place, and that these radical psychedelic researchers, all they had was drugs and they were experimenting with them to see what behavioral change took place, it all just became really simple. That it comes down really to building this sense of sacred temple and noticing what we invite in. Moving on from Naropa, I completed a PhD in anthropology and social change at the California Institute of Integral Studies. My research project became an activist ethnography. Uh, because of contemplative practices, I started a, a grounded theory discovery with adult couples that use MDMA recreationally. What contemplative practices offered my academic pursuit was this sense of slowing down and noticing what I take in from the academic literature and making intentional, pur purposeful decisions about what I send out as my academic voice. In my research, I wanted to explore specifically how these adults were using this substance both outside of the medicalized narrative heralded by psychedelic researchers, but also outside of the recreational use that's supposed to be dangerous at clubs and raves. What I really wanted to get down to was how these couples are using MDMA in the context of their relationship. In short, these adults risk breaking the law and being labeled drug user in order to, or, or to face the stigma of being labeled a drug user because of the lasting and durable effects that MDMA has on their relationship. It's not just about having fun or dancing and being high, but maybe two or three times a year these people would invite this substance into their relationship, into their sacred temple, to encounter the 
uh, deeper intimacy, the practice of communication that they had together, and this sense of sacred temple and deeper conversation. It became clear to me that MDMA is no quick fix for these couples. But by interviewing these people, it gave me the first glimpse of what it means to be in right relationship with a drug. So what this transformation has looked like post-contemplative education is learning that this, sacred, this sense of sacred temple extends not only to myself and relationships with others, but also my academic research, writing, and social activism within my community. By slowing down this process, noticing what we invite in and what we send out, grassroots organizing can build a community around the sense of right relationship. For our Colorado nonprofit, the NOAC Society, I had the good fortune of organizing with other like-minded Naropa folks, and together we decided on the mission to educate and support people and communities in building informed, safe, and empowering relationships with ourselves, others, and the drugs and medicines that we interact with. Together, we were all aware of this felt sense of contempt and distrust for oppressive systems like the psychopharmaceutical industry. However, instead of sending out more fight and resistance to that, we focused on building up instead of tearing down. What this has looked like, for instance, is the Learning and Self-Development Collaborative as part of a grant for the excellence in mental health care, of which the NOAC Society, we work to develop a consciousness-raising peer support curriculum that look to help young folks understand and feel supported through intense emotional, mood, and behavior-related issues without psychiatric labels or medical diagnosis. So teaming up with a naturopathic doctor for their individual wellness, this consciousness-raising curriculum and peer support groups offer these young folks the chance to explore and discover their own sense of right relationships with themselves, their families, their communities, and the medicine dr medicines and drugs that they use. We offer the chance to explore their identities and social locations, to explore their emotional pain in a social context. For instance, we look at our culture and our society, and we help the young folks explore the types and impacts of both obvious and hidden forms of oppression. We look at things like racism, sexism, ageism, and the patriarchy. We explore the shoulds and shouldn'ts that people encounter and help them to explore for themselves just how they do or do not feel authentic in their lives. We talk about spiritual emergency, and we work to normalize how common it is for people to have these big experiences like hearing voices or empathic knowing or prophetic visions. Did you know that hearing voices is as common as being left-handed? For something that's so statistically common, our culture does little to comfort or understand these things outside of a medicalized narrative. And we, we, we do little to comfort people uh, without medicalizing it as problems, diagnosis, and chemical behavior management. Helping these young folks to deepen, the curriculum is rounded off by allowing them to become the expert of their own experience. By problematizing the issue of drugs versus medicine, we we'll encourage these people to track their own experiences, to document and record both the intentions for and outcomes from taking drugs and medicine. Working to help empower their decisions and slow down this process, the model, we, we slow down this process to a model that involves everything but psychiatry. For us, it's not about arguing whether pharmaceuticals are magic cure-all pills or if mushrooms put someone at risk for mental instability. Really, what it comes down to is for people to discover their own sense of right relationship and make empowered decisions with what they invite in. This notion of right relationships with drugs and medicines stems from contemplative practices, and it really comes down to... Excuse me. really comes down to... Mm. Pardon me. For my inner journey of social change, this has been the story of how contemplative practices has transformed my sense of who I am in the world, which in turn transformed what it means for me to be in relationship with others and to organize as an activist in my community. So by sharing these encounters with contemplative practices and lessons from my lived experience, 
I hope that I've conveyed just how the inner journey of contemplative education has completely transformed my outer quest for lasting social change. Thank you.